at a caseworker who was working with someone who has been issued a voucher but um, can't uh, can't find uh, a proper rental uh, in in the 90 days the housing authority is is giving uh, the client time to find the rental um, and it's because it's very difficult to find accessible housing so um, what I, you know two parts to that um, first of all yes it's it's a it's a problem even even with with non-accessible apartments is a problem with anybody to be able to find a, um, a, a an apartment that will accept a voucher in 90 days. Um, across the country, um, there are many landlords that are just not accepting vouchers from, from Section 8 uh, recipients at all, mostly due to the myth about what um, what Section 8 renters um, do to properties and, and uh, so forth. So um, as far as an accessible apartment, though, it's, it's even more difficult to find an accessible apartment in 90 days because they're not well organized on the Internet. Um, most advertisements don't say, hey, this is an accessible apartment. One tip I can tell you is that any federally financed property, even if it's an older federally financed property, um, is required to um, at least adapt an existing unit if, it, if it's a reasonable accommodation. It's literally, literally called reasonable accommodation. Um, so let's say, for example, someone in a wheelchair um, needs to have uh, controls on the oven on, the, on the, the front rather than the back, and that's a reasonable accommodation for them to switch out the stove with uh, a handicap accessible stove, stove versus a, um, a stove with back with rear controls. Um, and then the other thing I'll tell you that'll help you, I think, with your client, if, if the client's willing to, to move into, say, an apartment community, um, the you know, newer tax credit, low-income housing tax credit properties um, have been targeting, um, much more lately, have been targeting units to, uh, to people with disabilities. Uh, so, for example, many, many new tax credit properties go over and above what's required um, in federally subsidized housing when they build new housing over and above what's required as far as the accessible unit percentage. So for example, many of these properties have 20% of their units that are accessible. They're along an accessible route and they're already equipped, not adaptable, accessible. Um, and on top of that, a lot of these properties are required to rent to hand, uh, people with disabilities. So they can't even rent it to a non-disabled person until they've spent 90 days or so, it depends on, on the property, but they, until they've proven that they can't find uh, a person with disabilities to occupy that unit. The way to find those properties is usually through your local um, disability services organization. Um, so if, um, it, you know, the it could be an area on aging, um, it could be a, a government agency or even a, uh, even a nonprofit that the property, the landlord, or even the, the local housing authority is partnering with. So, um, okay, there was another question, and then I'll, um, well, actually, why don't I go ahead and jump into the update. Nate, can you bring the update up? Because I lost everything when my computer crashed. Okay. All right, so, um, so Vicki, I will, um, I'm going to do a quick update, talk about the, the Section 8 waiting list openings that we found in the last week, and then I'll, um, I'll get to you. So, um, and I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, Gia Uga, Gia Uga County, Ohio, um, the Section 8 waiting list is opening from October 13th until October 27th. Free applications will be available online and at their office. Um, there, four preferences have been identified. Uh, there's no limit on how many qualified applicants um, they'll place on the waiting list. Uh, and so if you want more information about that, you can go to our website for and, and, and search for that county. Um, the Cobb County, Illinois, the Housing Authority of the Cobb County, uh, Section Housing Choice Voucher and Public Housing Waiting Lists are opening to the general public on October 20th at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. Uh, these waiting lists are currently open on a limited basis, only for households that are elderly, disabled, or have been displaced by a natural disaster or government action. 
And according to the Housing Authority, only applicants who qualify for two or more local preferences and are income eligible will be placed on the waiting list. It's actually, I haven't heard of that before, um, and we're trying to verify that fact because usually the regulation says that um, that you can't exclude anybody from a housing choice voucher waiting list opening. You can establish preferences, but um, but you can't say that if you know you can't require someone to meet that preference. It's simply a preference, a ranking preference. Um, so we're, we're trying to verify that, and we'll post that to the Cobb County, uh, Illinois page. Uh, Mansfield, Connecticut, the Mansfield Housing Authority Section 8 Housing Authority Voucher Waiting Lists are opening soon from October 21st to October 23rd. Um, these are online applications, and um, no preferences have been identified. Uh, we'll keep uh, tabs on that. They will be placing 250 qualified applicants on the waiting list by random lottery. Again, you can find information about that on the Mansfield, Connecticut page on our site. Um, and Clayton County, Georgia, we don't see a lot in Georgia, so um, it's always exciting to see something happen in Georgia. The Jonesboro Housing Authority Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher waiting list is currently open from October 5th to October 9th. Um, and that's, it closes at four o'clock Eastern time on the 9th. Pre-applications are available online. It's always exciting to see online applications because um, it makes it a lot easier for folks to apply. Um, no preferences have been identified and uh, they'll place 1,200 qualified applicants on the waiting list by random lottery. You can get information about that on Affordable Housing Online just by searching Clayton County, Georgia or Jonesboro Housing Authority. Um, and then lastly, I want to touch on one that, uh, Nate, this one's this one closed, right? No, it's still open. It's still open. Okay, so the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, uh, their Section 8 voucher waiting list opened in September on September 9th. Um, it's open indefinitely, and pre-applications uh, are still available online. Uh, no preferences have been identified, and... Um, the Housing Authority had stated that it would make a lottery poll to issue 200 vouchers by October 5th. Um, and then according to a news article we just, we just stumbled on from October 6th in the Columbus Dispatch, more than 24,000 households applied for the waiting list um, in, in, Colum in the Columbus metropolitan area. Um, you can get more information about that opening on, our, on Affordable Housing Online at the Columbus, um, Ohio page. Okay, so that was the that's a quick update of the waiting list that we discovered in the past week. Um, you can always find that information on our site at affordablehousingonline.com. I'm going to go in to answer a few questions. I've got I'll, I'll I'll sit here as long as people have questions for me. And the first one is Vicky Shockley. Hi. Hi. Ooh, how are you? Hi, Vicky. I'm good. good. I have. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm glad to actually Thanks have. For us. So while Vicky is reconnecting, I'll um, I'll remind everyone that if you have a poor bandwidth, if you're not on Wi-Fi, uh, it's often very difficult to. Um, to connect, um, uh, from my experience over the last six weeks using Blab, two out of three folks who try to connect get booted. Um, and I'm not sure there's any immediate solution to that. It's just about internet bandwidth, but you can try to get back in, Vicky. Um, anybody else want to pop in to ask me a question? Otherwise, I'm just going to move to a question that came in over, throughout the last week. Um, so let's talk about smoking. Um, I am I'm a former smoker myself. Um, I think I quit eight or nine years ago. And um, smoking is bad for you. I don't know if anybody, anybody knew that, but it's bad for you. And a lot of property owners, a lot of housing authorities, um, a lot of management companies are, are, are deciding to institute smoking bans at apartment communities, at public housing communities, uh, and, and just, you know, 
uh, general you know, apartment complexes. Um, and it's really started to happen um, more and more often as of late with public housing authorities where they where a housing authority decides to make their entire public housing uh, portfolio smoke free. And smoke free means you can't smoke anywhere, including your own apartment. Um, you can't smoke in the parking lot, only in designated places. Um, many times they'll put some sort of shelter up where it's a gazebo or a park bench along the perimeter of the property. Um, but you literally can't smoke in your own apartment. And, and, I, and frankly, I think that's a good thing um, because when you're smoking in your apartment, most apartments aren't that tight. And the little, the, you know, the baby that's sleeping upstairs above you is inhaling your smoke because it really does go through the walls. I and mean, if you've ever lived in a, an apartment complex where the neighbor smoked, you could also you could always smell the smoke. So um, I would recommend that you make sure you understand what the smoking policy is of your property. Um, it can be a lease violation. Um, I I have my I myself own a couple of apartment communities where we've instituted smoking bans. Um, just because of the health reasons, and um, and we are we are adamant that our that our tenants follow the rules. And if the manager uh, the manager sees you smoking or smells smoke coming from your apartment, we will issue a lease violation. So you got you should really make sure that you know what your apartment's policies are. Um, okay, what else you got for me, Nate? All right, I am having difficulty completing the online pre-application. Can you help me? Um, well, so that question is, it's a little difficult to answer because I don't really know what part of the application you're having difficulty with. Um, uh, usually online applications are pretty, um, pretty basic. Um, you, what you can expect to have is you know, you're going to fill out your name, your contact information, your social security number, usually um, your income information, and then your family members. And so you're just going to ask for you know the names and ages of, of kids in the household, with your spouse or partner, um, and and then do you have any sort of you have a handicap, you know, are you a victim of domestic violence, all the preferences that might be on the Section 8 waiting list, you're also going to see questions in the pre-application that will allow them to determine whether or not you meet those preferences. Um, but for the most part, it's usually just one page, if, you know, a one-page form, um, and it shouldn't take you more than a few minutes. You don't really need that many documents. You need to understand what your income is. Um, and, and kind of compute that before you get before you start the application. Um, so it would help if we if we understood a little bit more about about what difficulty you're having and what application it is. So if you want to post to the comments, um, we'll we'll try and get back to you and and and, um, and help you through that. All right, I have a request coming in from John Cruz. Um, try and bring John into the video chat. So John, if you're if you're coming in from um, if you're coming in from 3G or so something like that, it's going to be pretty difficult to to connect. But um, we'll keep trying. All right, Nate, what do you have for me? Um, uh, I tried applying to an online application, but the website doesn't show anything. What's going on? Does that mean it's a scam? Um, so. So um, there's lots of scams out there. You, it's hard to answer that. It's, it's hard to say yes or no. Um, but if you're going into what you know is a legitimate housing authority page, and if you, if you start with our, our site, if you start with affordable housing online, um, I can assure you that we go to great efforts to make sure that we are validating any place that we send our users. So. If you, if you come to affordable housing online, you find an opening you wish to apply for, or you read, it, read about it, and we provide a link to that housing authority, uh, rest assured that we've made sure that that's not a scam site. 
So if it's completely blank and you know that you're going to the right link, then it's very likely that it's something that just opened up and their, their website's crashing. And we see this all the time. We see, uh, we see Section 8 waiting lists, uh, online applications crash within the first hour or two because everyone, um, everyone's going there at once. Um, so what I would recommend is, you know, wait a little while. Usually online applications aren't first come, first served. That means that even if you, if the online applications open for two days, even if you apply halfway through your second day that it's open, you're still, you still stand as much of a chance of getting on the list as the person who was the first to apply when it opened up the day prior. So, um, if you're seeing a blank page, I'd recommend just, um, just keep trying back. And, um, and, and again, um, make sure that you're visiting a legitimate link to a legitimate housing authority. And if, if you follow, if you go through our site, then, um, then we can assure you that you are. All right, John, I'm gonna try and go ahead and plug you in again. In the meantime, Nate, you have another question for me? Uh, all right, so John, while we're trying to connect you, and it looks like you're coming in probably through a mobile device with, um, with, with uh, poor bandwidth. Um, I need emergency housing assistance. What am I eligible for? So um, a lot of what we talk about is the Section Housing Choice Voucher Program. And I, I, often, I often say that that program is not an emergency assistance program. Um, many times it's, it, there's people that wait uh, years, and I mean like seven, eight, nine years sometimes uh, in larger cities or, or, or longer for assistance. So that's not really an emergency assistance program. There are other, there are other emergency assistance, um, housing assistance opportunities out there. Uh, most cities uh, have more than one homeless shelter, um, and Nate will Nate will try and post some information about that. Um, it, most of uh, of, our, of the structured housing programs that we cover on Affordable Housing Online are not uh, homeless emergency assistance programs. They're a little bit long, longer term, but um, Nate's gonna, they will, will throw a link up on, uh, on the comment thread. Okay, uh, another question. Almost all openings I see are for families. What is available for single people with no kids looking for help? So um, that's not an accurate statement. There is no program that, uh, that excludes single people. Um, federal housing programs do not distinguish between family size when determining whether or not someone's eligible. So the Housing Choice Voucher Program, it doesn't say that a single person doesn't, can't, can't receive a, a voucher. Um, and then apart, uh, uh, subsidized apartment communities also don't say, and, unless, it's, unless they don't have a unit that size appropriately. If, it, if the property only has two bedroom units, then a single person can't can't occupy a two bedroom unit. But for the most part, um, almost almost all affordable housing communities have at least a few one bedroom units. So um, I, I would say that you're you're looking at it the wrong way if you think you have to have children to qualify for affordable housing assistance. That is not the case. All right. Um, what else you have for me, Nate? And meanwhile, I'll try to connect John. Anybody else want to join the chat? Just click on the join button right there. Um, and I'm going to be, we, uh, let's see, Joel, Henry, let's try Joel. Get two people I'm trying to connect, and another one of them can connect. All right. Um, any other questions? Here's one. A lot of applications are available online only. I don't have a regular internet connection. What can I do? Um, so, you know, for the most part. Um, 
housing authorities are starting to move to online applications, which is a really good thing. Um, paper applications and person applications are very prohibitive. So, it, so those those two older technologies exclude far more people than 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 um, online applications exclude. So, you know, in the end, more people have access via online applications than not. If you don't have a regular internet connection, I would just recommend, I'd recommend you go to the library. Um, most housing authorities, when they post their openings, will give you um, specific addresses where you can go to access a computer. Many times they'll even have someone there that will help you if you're not accustomed to filling out online forms. Um, and, and then most, of the most of the waiting list software out there is fairly mobile friendly. Um, about 80% of our users come to affordable housing online on a mobile device. Um, and we would assume that the same goes for online section eight applications. So um, most of the, those that, that application software is quite, um, quite mobile friendly. So if you have a mobile phone, if you have a smartphone, and you can get to a free Wi-Fi connection at McDonald's or Starbucks or another, you know, another place that's giving away free Wi-Fi. There's another opportunity for you. So, um, all right, John Cruz, I'm going to try connecting you one more time. Okay, that's not working. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and answer the last question. And um, and then and then call it this. Uh, this particular talk show has turned out to be full of technical bugs. So I think we're going to focus the next week on making sure that we don't have technical problems and do a little bit uh, better job next week. So last question: How do you try and get Section Eight? How do you get Section Eight? It's one of the probably the most basic question that we get. And um, the Section Eight program is basically it's a it's a rental assistance program where you uh, you only pay for rent based on your income so whatever you know 30 percent of your income is what you what we, you would pay for pay in rent so if you're if you earn a thousand dollars a month 30 percent of your income is three hundred dollars and that's how much you would pay for rent if you had a section eight voucher even if the rent is a thousand dollars a month you would still only pay $300 and the Section 8 voucher would, um, would pick up the rest. So how do you get that? Section 8 is perhaps, it's not perhaps, it is the most um, sought after and underfunded housing assistance program in America. Um, there's something like nine or 10 people that are eligible for it, for every person that receives it. The funding has actually gone down over the years. Um, and, um, and, and uh, there's no indication that funding is going to go up. So the scarcity of that housing assistance will continue, which forces housing authorities to do waiting lists. Um, housing authorities will, um, will establish a waiting list that is at, you know, usually at least two years long, and then they'll close it, and then they open it every once in a while. They're allowed to, um, they're allowed to close it whenever the wait the, that they have two years' worth of applicants. So um, you have to wait to get to, 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 to apply for Section 8. You've really got to find a waiting list that's already open, or you have to wait um, until your local housing authority's waiting list opens. To find a good list of those, if you go to Affordable Housing Online, you click on the green button at the top that says Section 8 Waiting List. Um, we have the only list in the entire country, HUT doesn't even have it, of every open waiting list or every waiting list that's opening soon. Um, so find one in your area or an area you wish to move to, and um, and then you you know if you click through to the specific housing authority, we'll, we write up you know the basics of what you need to do to apply, and we always link out to the official housing authority site where you can actually apply. Um, if you choose to apply to a housing authority that's not in your area, remember that if you're if you're eventually chosen. For a voucher, you'd have to move there and live there for one year before you could bring that voucher back or to another city. Um, but that's basically how you apply for Section Eight. All right, um, I do have I have two folks that are asking to come in. Let's see how their bandwidth is. I'm going to try bringing in Joyce Williams. And while I'm trying to bring in Joyce, I'll also try to bring in Deborah. Um, Hello. 
How long does it take okay, to get boys. a response? Hi. From the housing authority. Um, from whom? Will you apply on a, for when both? you've applied for Section Eight, you mean? Um, so usually, uh, so let's say yes. the waiting list opens up and you've applied. Is that what you're talking about? Um, well, if it's a lottery and you're selected for the waiting list, they would normally notify you right away, like like within um, a month or two following your application. If it's a lottery and you weren't selected in the lottery to be added to the waiting list, some housing authorities send a notification and some don't. Um, the ones that don't normally say in their public notice and any of the information that we post, they will normally say, uh, well, if you, um, you know, we'll let you know if, you're, if you make the list and you won't hear from us if you don't make the list. Um, so, it, it, the answer to your question is really depends on where you're at, depends on how many people are on the waiting list, and uh, it, it's kind of a difficult answer. I'm really sorry that I can't give, some, give you something more specific. Yes, um, what does, um, that, does it matter if you're applying in a different city? Um, yes. If you apply in a different city than where you live now? Yeah, so that's the thing. Every every housing authority's management process is different. One housing, the housing authority in your city, when you apply, may send you a notice as soon as you apply, saying, "Yeah, we got your application." And then another housing authority somewhere else may have a completely different policy. So you really have to read read about the posting. So read about the opening that that other housing authority has and see what their notification process is. And usually they'll include information about it. And if they don't go to their website, it, they usually provide a lot more information on their website itself than some of the other stuff you might come across in public notices. Or, um, it's, it, it, you know, it's okay, like I said, it's you. different from housing authority to housing authority. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna try bringing in Deborah again. Um, while I'm waiting, if uh, if you want to be notified whenever we see, doesn't want to accept your try again there. Uh, if you want to be notified whenever I go on on live, you hit the little the little plus next to the little man up top. Um, that will you'll follow us on Blab, and so whenever we start doing this again, you'll get a you'll get a quick. Um, You'll get a notice that we're going online. Um, again, just hit the little plus guy up top. I always point to the wrong side, so it's up here somewhere. All right, um, try Deborah one more time and see if I can connect Deborah. If you want to come on live with me right now and ask a question, all you have to do is hit that join button um, there in front of you. And it looks like Deborah's bandwidth is inadequate. Barb. All right, let's try Barb. I always feel like I hit the lottery if I can connect somebody because the bandwidth issues here are, um, are quite prohibitive. Uh, Marion Brooks, I'm gonna try bringing you in, Marion. Looks like we're connecting to Marion. Hi. How are you, Marion? I wanted to know if you had a recertification for housing in North Carolina, and then um, you say you had a child living with you, and that um, uh, a record, and they want to terminate your housing, um, but you did an appeal, and they were- Hey, Mar Marion, Marion, I'm sorry. The first part was very garbled, but now it seems to be better. Can you start at the beginning again? Okay, like I did a research in July. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's great now. Mm -hmm. I did a research in July, and um, my son had a, a, a assault charge, but it was dropped to a um, no trespassing. Um, and they want to terminate my voucher, 
but she just called me like last Friday to do a hearing on the following Monday. Okay. Um, is that legal? Do you know? Um, it's a very, very specific question, and um, I purposely don't try not to answer legal questions because I, I it's that's I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I'll ask. So, is your son a minor? Is he under? No, is he, he's is he, but he's also um, since you know we did the research, he's moved out now. Okay, well that helps. That helps if he's no longer on your lease. Um, I was doing some research for another caller a couple of weeks ago. And um, I remember reading something about about this situation where if someone in the household um, had some sort of criminal offense that was a problem, you know, with the housing authority's policy, um, one way to request an exception was to have them reconsider um, their decision because that occupant who had the criminal offense has has since moved out. You have another layer there because I think you, I think I think I heard you say that his um, the offense was downgraded, right? It was. Yeah. yeah. So I think the best thing is to just talk to the housing authority. I mean, are, so at this point, you think they're going to take your voucher? Yeah, she says she was. I, I'm I'm going to give them a letter from the attorney um, informing them that um, that it was dropped down, that it was dismissed drop down you might also consider if 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 they say uh, usually when a decision like that of course is subject to um your your appeal rights so normally if they do this you still have the right to appeal their decision if they do end up doing that um i would recommend that you contact an attorney um and, and if you can't afford an attorney you can contact a legal aid attorney in your area and they're up, um we'll, we'll post a uh, a link to a directory of legal aid attorneys from across the country that would help you. I think that you probably have a case, especially if he's no longer living in the household to, to be able to retain your voucher. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Okay. Um, looks like we actually have more people now than we, than we, than we did when I first started this. So I'll, I'll hang out for a little while because Nate's posting a bunch of questions for me here. Um, all right. If you want to join this video call and ask me a question on the screen, all you do is hit that join button right there next to me. Um, and I'm going to go ahead through some of the questions that are posted in the comments. Uh, let's see. I applied in 2007 in New York City. I wonder if they called me and I missed my turn. I logged in to see my status and it says that I am on the preliminary waiting list since 2011. Okay, so New York City's housing choice voucher waiting list has been closed for an extremely long period of time. And it's something like 15 years old long. It's probably the longest I've, um, longest waiting list in the country. I'm trying to remember the numbers I've, um, we, we get this question a lot. So we have a lot of units come from New York City. Um, but there's something there's something like a few hundred thousand people on the waiting list. You're probably one of them. Um, and if you log in to, to check your status and it says that you're on the waiting list, then I think that's, um, that's pretty accurate. Uh, they're not going to contact you um, very often. Every yeah, you know, I don't know what New York City's policy is on purging. The housing authorities will contact the waiting list applicants every year or two to make sure that you're still in town. And they'll ask basically ask you to update your your um, contact information. Um, so just make sure when you do log in that your contact information is still accurate so that they can get to you. Um, but they're not gonna they're not gonna really pain you and remind you every once in a while that you're still on that list. So it's gonna be your responsibility to keep logging in and checking. All right, so the next question. Um, so I tried to apply um, for other areas outside of my city. I'm applying to every single opening across the country. Not sure if I'm just rolling the dice here. Um, they may just consider applicants from their city. This whole thing may be a crapshoot, not sure. Uh, that's, that's, that's a fair question. Um, 
but it's not. We have, you know, so so we have the most complete database of Section 8 waiting list openings in the country. We have 420 some uh, that are that we have information on. We provide very specific information on how to apply to, and we have lots of users. Uh, hot, we, we we literally have hundreds of thousands of people that go to that one web page every month looking for openings to apply to. Um, and there are, and many of them are doing the same thing you're doing and we get reports back, we get thank you notes on our Facebook page and our email inbox from, from users that say, thank you so much. I wouldn't have found out about this opening if it wasn't for you and I've just been called for my voucher interview. So you're not rolling the dice, you, you know, if you're willing to move and you want to change your life and, um, and, and get the assistance that you need to find a better home for you and your, and your family, then I think you're doing the right thing. Um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like anything else. If you, if you apply for one job, you have one chance to get a job. If you apply for a hundred jobs, then you have a hundred different people, you have a hundred different employers that may call you. And, and so the more applications you can complete, the better. Um, I advise you to try and look for the online applications. They're the easiest ones to do. You don't have to print out and mail paper, which can cost you be costly if you're doing any of them. And you don't have to make a trip to the locale to do an in-person application. Um, so no, I don't think it's a crapshoot. I think that if you know, if you, it's certainly certainly if you're in a town, if you're in like New York City, where it's a ten-year, twelve-year, fifteen-year wait, whatever the wait is for a voucher, certainly if you're willing to move to West Virginia or rural Texas or or somewhere else that may not be as a popul populous an area, you're definitely going to get a voucher much faster there than you would in New York City. Um, and then once you're there for a year, you can always move back. So no, I mean, don't give up. I would suggest you keep doing what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. Okay. I have one more question. I have an open seat here. Anybody wants to join me? Um, uh, happy to answer any questions you've got. I'm going to take this last question over in the ch chat stream. All right, Joel, I'm going to try to out one more time, Joel. So far, I've been unsuccessful in connecting you based on bandwidth, I think. All right, while I'm trying to connect Joel, uh, the question is, if I ever do get a voucher, can I look in a different state or only in the area of the voucher? Also, realistically, can one ever find a single unit, not an apartment, but a house that takes Section 8? Two questions there, and they're both very good. Um, first part, if you get a voucher, you can't then take that voucher somewhere else in the country once you're issued a voucher, you have to use that voucher in the, the location that you issued the voucher. So if you're in Baltimore City, for example, and Baltimore City calls you and says, good news, you came up on the waiting list, and we're going to issue you a voucher, you can't say, well, actually, I decided to move to Sacramento, California. I'm going to take this voucher and move to Sacramento. You can't do that. You would have to use that voucher in Baltimore. Um, you'd have to live there for a year. Um, and then you could go through the portability process and move your voucher to, um, to, to Sacramento. So um, that's, that's how, that, the, how the portability work, rule works. Um, also, realistically, um, can one ever find a single unit, not an apartment, but a house that takes Section 8? That's a, um, that's a developing problem in in America, there's a lot of um, single family landlords that are starting not to accept Section 8 vouchers. So it is a little more difficult to find a single house um, than it is a, a, an apartment uh, in an apartment community, but it's not unheard of. So, you know, and, and then don't, don't forget that there's 19 or 20 different jurisdictions in America, including Chicago and New York and the state of Oregon um, and other places that prohibit landlords from discriminating against you based on the fact that you're using a voucher to pay for your rent. Um, so if you live in some of those areas, you know, a single family landlord can't tell you no based on that. Um, but no, there's plenty of single family rentals out there. And in fact, the Housing Choice Voucher Program was kind of designed um, to help people move into suburban neighborhoods and, and less dense neighborhoods. 
Um, that's why it's called the housing choice voucher. So kind of the intent of the program is to do that anyway. So I would, you know, just keep looking um, uh, and you, you should find in any, in any place that, that where there's a voucher program, you should find at least a few landlords that, that have single family homes that are willing to uh, accept your voucher. All right, um, we got one more person I'm gonna try and bring in. Oh, there we go. Peggy, how you doing? Yes. Danielle? Is it da Danielle? I'm doing all right. How you doing? How are you? I, I got a um, Cessna voucher what can I do in for you? Tamanoga, Tennessee. And I was trying to see, like, my voucher expired November the 4th. Is there any way that I can renew it? Because I stay in appointment right now that don't accept the voucher. Okay, so um, um, you broke up there a little bit. Yeah. You you have a voucher now. Um, and how long ago was it? Uh, so you're not using the voucher nope. for your current residence? And how long have you been there at the current residence? For like two years. How do you ha how do you sell the voucher? I just got it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So it was just issued to you. Okay. Um, and Tennessee. You, what what city are you in? You're in Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. Are you you're, are you in Chattanooga? Oh boy. Uh, okay. So Chattanooga is is a problem area. I don't know exactly why. Um, but Chattanooga, about a half to two thirds of people in your shoes lose their voucher because. Because you can't find a you can't find a landlord that's willing to accept a Section Eight voucher. I've read over and over news stories about Chattanooga. I don't know what it is about landlords in Chattanooga that that, that don't want to accept Section Eight. Um, but you're not alone. Um, I also know I know and the Chattanooga Housing Authority knows they have a problem and they're doing a lot of extra things that housing authorities don't always do to try and resolve the problem. I can tell you that I did read a news story recently that the Chattanooga Housing Authority, I think maybe even last month or in August, sponsored a landlord um, tenant fair where they, they basically had landlords come in and set up tables to show off their properties and match the landlords with Section 8 recipients. Um, so they're doing stuff to try and help the problem. Uh, I think part of it's just outreach to the landlord community to, to show the landlord community that Section 8 recipients are good, you know, can be really good tenants. So have you talked to the housing authority about the problem that you haven't been yeah. able to find a, an apartment? They told me that I couldn't renew it or anything, and they said I'll just lose it on November the 4th. I got it on. Okay. I think I, think I got it like, yeah. like yeah. two months ago, something like that. How many? How many landlords? How many rentals have you applied to? I haven't to? found any yet. Um, they gave Where me a list, searching? but the list they gave me, all the houses was inspired. And I'm probably going down to get another one today, so I'm going to go down a little bit get another one. Okay. One thing. One tip I will tell you is that any federally subsidized apartment community. Um, and I'm not talking about a Section Eight property or public housing property. I'm talking about like a uh, a private, a private apartment property that has received some sort of federal subsidies, like a low income housing tax credit property, um, they aren't allowed. They're not allowed to turn you down if you have a voucher. So you might take a look at some of those established apartment communities um, to see if, and, and you can find a list of those on affordable housing online. Nate will print, post a link to our page, okay. um, our Chattanooga page. So you might want to you might want to call some of those. If you look at the L I H T C list uh, on our page and look and and contact those properties, I can tell you that they they are not going to be allowed to discriminate against you based on the fact that you have a voucher. And for the most part, those properties, those management companies like to have um, folks with vouchers um, because many times the units that they're trying to rent. Um, don't have rent subsidies associated with them, so it's a lot more difficult to find someone that can pay the whole rent. So they actually welcome in voucher holders. So I would start there, and we'll, you know, like I said, we'll go ahead and post a link for you to, to the chat okay, page you. on our site. 
Thank you. Have a good day. All right, bye-bye. Okay, um, last call on that open seat. Um, Nate, do I have any questions I haven't answered yet? Um, it just came in, I'm giving it to you. Okay. Um, so while Nate's throwing up this last question, um, if you've not been here before, I'm David Layfield. I'm the founder of Affordable Housing Online. I'm an affordable housing expert uh, and have been doing this for 20 some, 25 years now. Uh, I do this little talk show every Wednesday here on Blab at three o'clock. And, um, and I just sit here and answer questions from callers that um, have questions about affordable housing assistance. Actually, I have Donna Kennedy asking to call in to see if we can patch in Donna. Anybody else has a question, you can hit that little join button. Um, I still have about eight minutes that I allotted. Uh, if anyone's got a question, I'll, hi. Um, I'll spend that time answering. Oh, <laughs> hi, Donna. How are you? I'm oh, on two lists for assisted living. You? I've had five strokes. Um, I've been accepted on a waiting list if it's for a year, but I'm running out of money on my mortgage. I have a 746 credit rating. Would you foreclose on this home at 995 a month to save the money or will that totally wreck? Hmm. Um, it's a little bit out of, I'll remind you this is a public forum, so try not to give too much personal information. Um, but uh, it's a little bit out of my realm of expertise. I would say, so I would start with, there's lots of resources out there, foreclosure assistance resources, um, especially since the real estate crash um, from 2008. So you really, I'm not, I'm not the person that, that can, can answer that question for you. I'm more of a rental um, expert. Um, but I would say don't, don't, lose, don't lose hope, um, especially if you think you have some equity. In, you know, I lost, you have some equity I lost in the my house. job four months um, I'm after thinking, I bought this home after working somewhere for 25 years. That was a year and a half ago. And I've taken all the money out of my IRA. And we're talking down to six thousand dollars, and I just don't know what to do. Um, I tell you, the first call you should make to your mortgage company, and you should ask the mortgage company um, just what you what, what you asked me. Um, and they're they're likely they're going to have a list of of organizations that can help. There's, there there are many other people in the same that have that are in the same circumstances. Um, and then and you also, if you want to, if you, uh, you can go to HUD.gov or just Google okay. um, foreclosure counseling and then, and, and then insert your city and state. Um, and you'll probably find a bunch of different organizations that out there that will help. But we have, we have since 2009, we have lots of leg legislation out there that's designed to help folks that are exactly in your position. Um, so like I said, don't give up hope. You'll find a solution to this. Uh, I am not going to be the one to give you the right answer, but there's, there are a lot of organizations of people out there that are willing to help and your mortgage company, if they're, if, you know, if they're a decent, if they're decent people, if it's a mainstream bank, and I'm not saying that well, bank, all bank, all mainstream banks are decent people. Don't don't take that as an endorsement on my part of banks, but um, but for the most part, they are going to at least try and connect you with some assistance. Well, they, they suggested one involved. thing that my realtor said would make my condition worse. So she said I didn't even read it. She said, "Do not sign that; you'll lose in the end." Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah, and, and if you have a good relationship with your realtor. Yeah, so she's she, trust. You can trust her more than you can trust them. I think so. Um, but but if you Google foreclosure counseling, you know Salisbury, Maryland, which is where we where we are here. If you Google foreclosure counseling in your city and state, um, you're you're going to end up at a at an agency that's actually paid by HUD by the federal government to help folks like you. And I think that's the best place to start because they're going to be able to tell you all of your options. 
Um, and believe me, there's a lot of options out there. And, and then, so if the mortgage company isn't working with you, um, then, <laughs> then they can, they can tell, they can help you make the mortgage okay. company work with you if it's within the law. Next time I'll remember to call my okay. before I Thank you. Him. All right. Uh, oh, it's fine. Great. I didn't come my either. All right. Have a good day. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, I have an open seat. I still have a couple of minutes to go, and it looks like I may have another question before I wrap this up. Um, will outside cities consider me, although I have no income to report? Um, so that's kind of a two-faceted question. First of all, you don't have to have any income to um, to qualify for a Section 8 application. Um, there is no minimum income for the Section 8 program. And, and so because of, because of that fact, um, it doesn't matter. If, and when you say outside city, I'm assuming you're saying a city that where you don't currently reside. Um, so since no housing authority under the Section 8 program can require you to have income, um, that that's not going to impact whether or not they accept your application. Now, there's there are other reasons. Um, many housing authorities have local residency preferences, not requirements. They're not allowed to have a local residency requirement unless they specifically get HUD to issue an exception. And I've only seen that two or three times. Um, but but uh, they may have a local residency preference that says that you get added to the waiting list last after a local residence, but that also has to be published. So to answer your question, will outside cities consider me, although I have no income to report? Yes, they will. And every other housing three will consider you too. So Nate, do I have any more questions? And Last call on that open seat. While I'm waiting on that last call, I want to plug this show I do every week on Wednesdays at three o'clock. If you hit this plus button up here, somewhere up here, there's a little man with a plus that you will follow me on Blab. And when I go online live, you will get a notice. Um, I would also recommend you visit our website, affordablehousingonline.com. Sign up for our mailing list. We send, uh, send an email out every Wednesday. Uh, letting you know about our new waiting list openings and promoting this. And we also send out localized waiting list alerts. If a Section 8 waiting list opens up uh, near you um, and you're on our mailing list, you will normally get a notice when it opens. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining me. And 